Hello everyone, Robert Dreiser here, and I'm gonna make a video about uh, people's reactions and reviews to my book, Open and Closed Guard. This is actually the Portuguese version. Obviously there's an English version out. It was written in English. I translated it into Portuguese. There's also a Polish version out. We're working on a German and Spanish version as well. But some of the most of the reactions overwhelmingly have been positive, right? Actually better than I thought it would be. The book is really about a documentary that I'm working on called Closed Guard the origins of jiu-jitsu to Brazil. So those of you who don't know about the project, the goal of the project was to tell a more complete account of how jiu-jitsu came to be. Like, why is it that we call it Brazilian jiu-jitsu? What is the difference between Brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo? What is the origin? What is the role that the Gracie family plays in all of this? And there's been a renaissance of research since 2012 regarding this because the Brazilian National Library digitized their files in 2012. So as a result, we know a lot more about this history than we used to. So I wanted to tell a more complete account inserting new characters and correcting some things and I knew right away that this was some people were going to see this as an attack on the Gracie family primarily Carlos and Helio which it is and anyone who read the book um, knows this perfectly well it's not an attack on any of them but there's some things that are incorrect and we wanted to correct them but you know we live in a world and I do mention this in the book because I knew it was going to be an issue people have this very binary view of things right like you're either Gracie or anti-Gracie there's no such thing as nuance there's no gray area like history is just this black and white thing you're either good or evil right you're either the devil or you're an angel there's nothing in between and I never liked that approach I think it's a very poor view on human psychology to look at things like that it's a very poor historical interpretation in fact to look at things like that so I want to respond to some of the criticism I made a video about a week ago, uh, Fabio Grugel, one of the co-founders of Alliance, he made a review of the book on his channel. And it was, it was somewhat negative. He believed that I wasn't um, unbiased. He thought I was very biased against the Gracie family. He, he attempted to correct me in some places. In fact, he even used some of the own arguments I use in the book to defend the Gracie family and give them credit. He tries to use the arguments against me as if I were attacking the Gracie family when he's using arguments that I put in the book they're in the text and he uses them to you know sort of refute the, the, the book and it's it really doesn't hold water and this is not an attack on him he, did, he was very polite in the video the video is not I did a Portuguese version of the video so people ask me to do an English version of the video it's not gonna be exactly the same but I'm gonna address some of the issues because this has been a common thing I mean like I got, have gotten some criticism and I think that the criticism is coming largely from people who are walking into this conversation and they already have an idea of what the book is. They're walking in with a closed mind and they're already gonna love it or hate it before they even opened it. And I think that's a very poor way of reading any book. Like you should walk in with the book with an open mind. It's not because it's from an author you don't like that you should have an all closed mind about it. Like you should, well, what's happening? Let's look at the facts. And I think that a lot of people walking into or reading the book with a very, they have already made up their mind that it is an anti-Gracie narrative or, you know, whatever else they're thinking. And I, I despise that sort of thinking because it's just poor reading in general. And I, I think it's very unfair with the research uh, that, we, that I have done and other researchers that have helped me throughout this process. I think it's very inaccurate, in fact. So the idea of this video is to correct some of the things that have been posed. Fabio Grugel does mention a few of them on his, on his review. And uh, I'm gonna uh, board them one by one here on this video. This is gonna be about talking some of these points of criticism that some people have. And uh, hopefully you guys, which if you have a closed mind about the book, about the history of Jiu Jitsu and gender, you're not willing to change your mind, hopefully after this video, you'll be at least give, give the book a chance and hopefully change your mind. Fabio Gujo brings up 14 points in his video, in his a review of the book. I mean, there are other ones, but I focused on the main ones. There's some overlapping there. I'm gonna try to tackle one by one as quickly as possible. I'm not gonna try not to make the video too long, but I think it's important that I abort, uh, approach these, these terms one by one and explain to you guys why I believe he is incorrect. And in fact, a lot of times he uses arguments of the book against the book uh, or he uses you know he, he omits the fact that I have responded to the point he makes that's already in the book I kind of knew that some of this criticism was going to come my way so I preemptively put that in the book because I knew it was going to be a thing but no I kind of skipped through that and just went straight to stick to the criticism without actually you know approaching the fact that I actually have responded to it in the text so one of them is that I'm partial that I didn't uh, that I'm anti-Gracie and that I, I was unable to to prove that Carlos Gracie was not a student of my, which we're gonna talk about that one next. 
But I do take the, the anti-Gracie charge a little bit seriously. Like if you, if, for those of you who read the book, you're probably confused by me saying that because I think that the end result is in fact very pro-Gracie, if anything. I think that the end result of the book, like the overall, I mean, this is at least my interpretation. I have a greater and deeper respect for what the Gracie family has done for jiu-jitsu. I think that they give themselves credit for things that they didn't do, and then they didn't give themselves credit for the things they, they did do. They were, fact, in fact, far more important, like resisting the expansion of judo in Brazil. I think that's far more significant, uh, whether they invented guard and leverage, for example, which is some people that some people say, but, uh, you know, some people believe that. But it's, it's not that important of an issue. The technical uh, uh, evolution is really a, pro, uh, a reflex. It's a, it's a side effect of competition. It happens in every sport, in every competitive endeavor, you're gonna have evolution, right? So Jiu-Jitsu in Brazil is no different. I think that the true um, contribution of the Gracie family to Jiu-Jitsu is in fact have to do with their resistance to Judo. I reject any kind of accusation of me being anti-Gracie or anti-Brazilian in any way. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think that there's no one other than researchers and historians who have put a lot more time than I have into this. And I know my place in this story. Some people have been researching this a lot longer than I have. And they have done a lot to bring back a lot of names, including the name of George Gracie. So I think that I, it's fair to say that other than some researchers and historians that have been researching this a lot longer than I have, no one, including no one in the Gracie family, has done more to bring back the name of George Gracie, for example. His name was buried in history. Most people have never even heard of him. And he's one of the founding fathers of MMA. In fact, he's the first hero of the Gracie family is George. So I went out of my way to try to bring his name back to life. So the idea that I'm an anti-Gracie in some way is just absolutely ridiculous to me. Uh, I point out to Hoist Gracie as a hero of my youth. That's in the book. You can read it. I point out to Carlson Gracie as my favorite Gracie of all time. I end the book with a homage to Carlson Gracie. There's a picture of me with Carlson Gracie in the book. And I, I mean, you can see I'm pretty happy in the picture. I was really excited to meet someone I considered a great man. And uh, till this day, I have great consideration for, for Carlson Gracie. He's passed a few years ago. I leave my admiration for Holes Gracie. I actually say at some point in the book that Carlos and Healy are more important than they give themselves credit for. And exactly for the reasons that I gave you earlier for the resisting judo. So the idea that I'm anti gracing somehow is absolutely absurd, that I'm being partial and biased makes me wonder, perhaps, am I the biased one? Am I the one who was biased when I'm bringing over a new interpretation with facts and research? Or are the ones who are biased are the ones who are dogmatic and refusing any deviation from the official narrative? Who's the biased one? me or people that are sticking to a narrative that is we know now is factually incorrect. So I reject entirely any notion of me being biased against Brazil or the Gracie family. I think it's quite ridiculous. In fact, for anyone who actually read the book is gonna agree with me. All right, point number two he brings up. He says that I can't prove that Carlos never learned from Maeda. Now this is a common problem interpretation for, I mean, I've made this mistake. You probably made this mistake at some point. So I'm not pointing the fingers at Fabio or anyone else for not understanding this, but, uh, if I make a claim, I'm the one who has to back up that claim. Someone who questions that claim does not have to provide any evidence, right? You can't prove a negative. You can't, you don't go around saying, telling people that you have to prove to me that Santa Claus doesn't exist. That's not how things work. If you make a claim, you're the one that's got to back it up. That's the premise of science. That's the premise of historiography. That is the cornerstone of all this, so this whole conversation. If you make a claim, you have to back it up, right? Fabio basically puts the burden of proof on me for saying that I was unable to prove that Carlos didn't train with Maeda, which is a huge confusion for people that don't always understand the scientific method and historiography. Very common mistake. I'm not blaming him. He's not, you know, he's not trained in, in, in history or scientific method. Uh, so it, it's, it's a common mistake, right? But it doesn't follow me. If you make a claim, you got to back it up. Uh, Carlos does make the claim that he trained under Maeda. It's the only testimony. It's the only there's nothing else really linking Carlos to Maeda. So I personally don't think it's that important of an issue. It's more of a curiosity. That's what I call it in the book, a curiosity. It is not, it doesn't say anything about the role that Carlos plays in the history of Jiu-Jitsu, which is central, is that people are obsessed with lineages, like lineages are everything, right? But the, the truth of the matter is Maeda does very little in Brazil, in my opinion. Like he's not central to the story in any way, shape or form. Carlos Gracie is, but not Maeda. The role with Maeda is exaggerated. I don't think he even, he barely makes the top 10, in my opinion, the most important people in the history of jiu-jitsu, barely. Uh, he's an interesting guy, I think he's important, but I wouldn't call him, I wouldn't call him uh, the cornerstone of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We're not even sure if he actually trained Carlos. I do mention at some point in the book that my personal opinion is that it is very likely that at some point they met. But in, in historiography, my personal opinion is worth 
zero, absolutely nothing, right? So it's not what I think that matters, it's what the evidence says, and the evidence does not suggest any kind of relationship. In fact, everything we know suggests Jacinto Ferro being the student, the, the teacher of Carlos Gracie. Jacinto Ferro, who in his turn was a student of Maeda. So what probably happened was when Carlos gets to Sao Paulo, like he's in the center of Japanese immigration in Brazil, he wants to make money uh, you know, in jiu-jitsu fights. He has zero credibility. No one knows who he is. People ask him, who's your coach? He goes, Mitsui Maeda. He was the most famous person in his hometown. He probably came out of the same gym because Jacinto Ferro was teaching there. Jacinto Ferro had been a student of Maeda. Whether Carlos trained with Maida at some point or not is not clear. We don't know. And that is the, I think that's the crux that people miss. I never said that he didn't train with Maida. I said there's no evidence. People are unable to make this distinction. Like, it's not the same thing, guys. If I say that someone, if I say that Carlos never, never met Maida, that's a, that's an, I'm, I'm affirming he never met him. I'm saying there's no evidence. Something can change tomorrow. So if some, someone tomorrow presents some evidence and confirms that relationship, I wouldn't be wrong. I am following proper methodology. I am writing history based off of the evidence we have right now. If something changes five, 10 years from now, I wouldn't be wrong for have written it that way. I was writing history based on what I had available. If it changes, I have to update my book and I would do that. And in fact, if someone corrects me, I would thank them. And I say that with no sarcasm. But as is, the relationship between Carlos and Maeda is speculation entirely based off the testimony of Carlos Gracie. Fabio at some point mentions Alexander Solzhenitsyn, which is, you know, a Soviet dissident, as an example of how oral testimony should be taken seriously. And I, you know, I, I think that's, that's problematic because once again, what makes the gulags a historical fact is not Solzhenitsyn's opinion by itself. His testimony as a victim of Stalinism is a small fragment of that history. There's an entire body of evidence to back up the gulags, right? Or the, the terrors of Stalinism in the Soviet Union. And that's why it is actually a factual account, not only because what Newton said so. No one is obliged to, no one has to believe someone and take them at their word because we know people lie. And that's not Carlos Gracie or me or you, everyone. We all lie to benefit ourselves. That's just human nature. So in history, we have to start by being skeptic and doubting, not by believing. And I think that point was missed on Fabio. Point number three, the importance and centrality of the Gracie family. The, the proportionality, he believes I'm not proportional when it comes to talking about the importance of Carlos and Helio. And I think this is somewhat natural because the narrative over the last you know, 70 years has always been so centered around Carlos and Helio. Anytime I introduce a new name like Gio Amori, like, um, like George Gracie, like uh, Takeo Iano, like Yasuichi Ono, and I start introducing these names, I think what happens is some of the attention is dispersed, especially because the audience has never heard of them. So there's just like this focus on this new character, right? Who are these guys, right? And, um, but because of that, perhaps he's under the impression that they're not central to the story or not, that I'm not proportional in how I approach this history. And I think that's very incorrect because uh, I did this out of curiosity. At one point I was writing the book, I typed in the name Helio Carlos and then, um, you know, Gio Mori and some of the other names. I just want to see who are the most cited names in the book. And I can't remember the exact order, but it was by far Carlos and Helio. They're the most central people, uh, the two characters to my book by far. So I think that right there goes to show that they are central to the story indeed, including my own interpretation. It's just that some people are under the impression that they're not central because I'm also talking about other people. And when people say that I'm being uh, biased, you know, because of that, that's very surprising, it's very shocking to me. Like, so you're sticking to this narrative and you're accusing me of being biased when I'm introducing new characters, right? Despite the fact that I'm doing it with evidence and showing that these people are in fact important and you're sticking to that old narrative that is entirely based off the testimony of one person and I'm the one who's biased. I think that is shocking. Point number four, he mentions that in fact, what the Gracie brothers do in World Jiu Jitsu because Jigoro Kano was doing Jiu Jitsu, he transformed it into Judo. In other words, he is repeating an old myth about Judo and Jiu Jitsu. That, you know, Jiu Jitsu used to be pure and Jiu -Jitsu, Jiu -Jitsu, Judo lost its purity and they're not teaching the real Jiu Jitsu anymore and the Gracie family rescued it. That is not true. What was being practiced in Japan before Judo is a, first of all, the word Jiu Jitsu meant a variety of schools, right? It was a very generic term. It did not mean what we call Jiu Jitsu now. What we do now is Judo, a variation of Judo. Judo specialized on the ground. We call it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. We could call also Brazilian Judo. But the fact of the matter, it is not pre Meiji Jiu Jitsu. Why? Because it was, that was a variety of schools that included sticks, swords, kicks, punches. It resembled very little what we do, but it was called jiu-jitsu. The thing is, 
Jigoro Kano school initially was called Kano Jiu Jitsu. It was a school, it was one of the many Jiu Jitsu schools at the time. When the first wave of immigrants starts coming over to the Americas, they're still using the term Jiu Jitsu and Judo like they're the same thing. Judo is just a modern term. When it begins a split, the split begins between the Gracie family and Judo in Brazil. What happens is they stick to the term Jiu Jitsu because they want to dissociate themselves from Judo. We're not doing Judo, we're doing something different. So they start using the word Jiu Jitsu. But in fact, they were doing Judo. The Gracie family are originally judokas. That is not controversial. Um, a good example of this, and I, I use this example in the book, there's this hyper focus on the match between Kimura and Helio, right? I don't think that match is that important. I think it's, it's, a, it's a known match, but I don't think it's historically that significant. I think the matches between Helio and Yasui Chon are far more significant. Why? Because they take place in a moment where I think the Gracie family begins to realize they're not going to defeat the Japanese at their game. That if they want to beat the Japanese, they're going to have to change the rules a little bit. So you see this debate about the length of the sleeves, the length of the matches, whether there are points or no points. Right, and the Gracie, the Gracie brothers are trying to undermine the advantage that the Japanese had standing. And even so, you see, you still see that there's an effort by Helio Gracie when he fights Yasui Chiono to stay on his feet. We know this because both times they fought, there were draws, no one won, but Yasui Chiono took Helio down 32 times the first time, 27 the second time. Now, if you get taken down 32 times in a match, what does that suggest? Well, you're trying to keep it on your feet, obviously. Because if you're on your back the whole time, there's no way someone's going to take you down 32 times. So my, I'm inclined to believe that at that moment in, in their history, they were trying to beat judokas. They were trying to beat the judokas at their game. They couldn't do it. So what do they do? we got to specialize where the judokas are weakest. Where was that? The ground. The Kodokan rules were changing around the same time. So as the Kodokan rule becomes more stand-up oriented, right? you see Brazilians going the opposite way. We're going to become more ground oriented. I also mentioned this is perhaps because of the influence of infrastructure in Brazil. That's my interpretation, okay? Um, if you go to Brazil, mats in Brazil are very small. There's not a lot of room. So you normally have to start on your knees. It's very difficult to practice stand-up because you have a lot of people in the room and the spaces are very tight. As a result, you start knee wrestling. I think for all these reasons, you see the specialization on an aspect of judo that Kodokan was increasingly neglecting over time. It is still part of their curriculum. It still exists. But as we all know, judokas became less and less uh, um, experts on the ground. They become more, uh, you know, worried about takedowns, and that is, you know, what we call now call Olympic judo. So even though the groundwork still exists, it's not something they've specialized in, and they lost more and more of that um, as you know they became more of an Olympic sport. Perhaps worried about ticket sales. Takedowns are prettier to watch than submissions and ground. You know, someone passing someone's guard. So maybe concerned with ticket sales and uh, ticket sales in the Olympics, they became more stand-up oriented. Maybe because of Jigoro Kano's prejudice, that might have been the case. For uh, he was he was not very um, a, a big fan of the ground. He prefers stand-up, perhaps because that was his tradition. That's where he came from. He came from schools that were specialized in standing, and you know, every as every instructor knows, we always like to teach what we're best at. Well, whatever we're not good at, we try not to teach because we don't know much about it. So there's a variety of reasons we can uh, talk about why judo moved away from the ground, but that's not the point. The center point here is that what the Gracie family was practicing initially was judo. There's no way around it. There's no such thing as Maeda teaching pre-Meiji jiu-jitsu. Maeda had no idea what pre-Meiji jiu-jitsu would have looked like because he never trained it. His experience is entirely under the Kodokan a brief experience in sumo, and a brief experience in catch wrestling in England. He never trained pre-Meiji Jiu-Jitsu, you have no idea. And as a consequence, Carlos and Helio also had no idea what Jiu-Jitsu would have. Point number five, fake fights. Um, he gives credit for, to the Gracie family for, you know, you know, not getting involved in fake fights. And then he points that George did, but Carlos and Helio didn't. First of all, I don't condemn fake fights. They were necessary at the time for entertainment purposes. If the modern fan could barely understand grappling, imagine in the early 1920s and 30s. Like, no one was going to be able to understand it. So what did they have to do? They had to fix these matches. These things were normal, right? I do give credit to Helio in the book, thanks to George Gracie, who brought it up, that Helio was the only one who never got involved in fake matches. To be fair on Helio, that's very honorable. Like, he just refused to fight a fake, fight a fake, fake match. That is not true of Maeda. That is not true of George Gracie. That is not true of Carlos Gracie. Carlos Gracie is also involved in a fixed match with Gio Mori. It's very obvious that he was, it was fixed because you see them at arguing in the press in Sao Paulo while they're friends at the same time in the press in Rio de Janeiro. Clearly, it's an orchestrated uh, relationship as Gio Mori does accuse them on of later on when they have a fallout. Once they have a fallout, Gio Mori comes over to the press and he goes, listen, it was all fake which is very believable. You gotta remember who Jiwa Mori was. He is a Kodokan black belt with international experience, much like Maeda. 
He is a dominant name in Sao Paulo at the time. Carlos was young. He hadn't trained, according to what we know, for eight years straight. Uh, and he shows up in Sao Paulo and he wants to create a name for himself. So Gaston Gracie, his father, who was a circus owner, he was a brothel owner, he was a fight manager, he understood entertainment is my point. He walks up to Jory Mori and goes, why don't we fix a fight? And if we fix a fight, we can make more money, we can build up the fight. And that's what happened. That's what Jory Mori claims to happen. And we believe this is true because while they're arguing in Sao Paulo as if they were enemies, their act, their, Carlos is acting as Jory Mori's manager in Rio de Janeiro around the same time. So. I don't blame them. I don't condemn them. But it is part of our history. There's nothing wrong with that. I probably would have done the same thing in their shoes. They had to feed themselves. Right? God, remember, there were not that many people willing to train in those days. So it's not that something that we should condemn them uh, for. But it's important to, uh, to register history accurately. This is not an attack. I'm just giving the facts. If you don't like the facts, that's your problem. The facts are unscathed. Six, the black belt issue. I make it clear in the book, this is not a centerpiece of the book. But it is interesting to note that um, there's some people get obsessed over this because they think it feels an attack. Once again, if you don't like the facts, you're the one with the problem, not me. Like, I'm just giving you what they are. Like, I'm not choosing which facts to deliver. I deliver plenty of facts, facts that are very, uh, they're condemning of judo in times. There are, they deliver plenty of facts that are, um, uh, I would say, a home issue of the Gracie family, in fact. They just are what they are. And I think that's what good history is. You can't select, oh, it has to be pro-Brazil or pro-US or pro-Gracie or anti-Gracie. I think that's very childish. I think that that's not how you write history. That's not how you read history. But, of course, you're going to get accused of these things because people are so stick to a certain narrative. The black belt issue. Who promoted Carlos and Helio? There is a group in Brazil that are claiming they have evidence that he was in fact promoted to judo um, by an organization called Jukendo. I've never seen evidence. That's why it's not in the book, but they claim they have this. They're going to publish it soon. So if Helio was promoted, he was to promoted to black belt of uh, judo black belt by, uh, by a judo organization in Brazil. Were they ever promoted to a black belt, a jiu-jitsu black belt? No, because there's no one to promote them. So in their view, and you can, you know, I believe that they were wrong about this, but they truly believe that they were creating something new, something that was not judo, and they wanted to call it something else, and they wanted a new hierarchy that was not a Kodokan hierarchy. So what do they do? They go and give themselves belts. They're first wearing blue belts. At some point, they're, reading, they're wearing red belts. Apparently, they never wore a black belt, although I have seen a picture of Helio wearing a black belt at some point. So at some point, he did wear a black belt. Uh, but, you know, it was not something there was anyone to promote them because in their minds they were creating something new. I even mentioned this is not going to make it in the documentary because I don't think it's that relevant, but it is a curiosity. I think that history needs to be registered and, you know, it is not an attack. They were creating something new. There's an interesting piece of this because a lot of times when I tell this jiu-jitsu history, judokas get all excited. You're like, yeah, you know, we've been saying this all along, which is true. Like a lot of things that judokas have been saying all these years is like you're basically doing judo, which is true. But then again, like there's some other things that the judokas don't like to hear. For example, Jigoro Kano, and I, I got this from Craze, Volume One, Chapter Five. Um, but it's it. Jigoro Kano was never promoted to black belt. Oh, he was he was promoting people under his new system, the judo system, before he had a diploma from Kito Ryu, which is the only diploma he's ever had. In other words, in some ways, Jigoro Kano saw himself as starting something new, and he was also self-promoting. Anyone who's starting something new is going to self-promote because there's no one above you. So these, this is somewhat normal, and the Gracie brothers are not unusual in this. They're just following a the tradition. This is any, Anyone who's going to start a new martial art is immediately the top of that hierarchy. So I don't think there's anything dishonest per se, but I think it needs to be registered. In their minds, they were starting something completely new. In reality, they were specializing in an aspect of judo. Point number seven, the issue of Brazilian cultural heritage. Now, because there's a lot of like debate between American Jiu-Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu going on, and I'm not going to get into that right now, because I'm American-born, but I was raised in Brazil, people assume by default in Brazil that I am pro-US. In Brazil, they assume that I am pro-America. So I have to explain myself. I really don't care about this sort of petty nationalism. I don't think it belongs in Jiu-Jitsu. I think there, there's an important time to be a nationalist in your life. It's not when you're talking about Jiu-Jitsu. And in terms of um, the quote, Brazilian cultural heritage, Fabio questions it at some point, saying that it is important for jiu-jitsu, and that's a point that I made in the book. He's just repeating what I said. I think it's very important. In fact, I think it is one of the fundamental aspects that made jiu-jitsu popular around the world, Brazilian jiu-jitsu popular around the world, is in fact Brazilian culture. Um, I don't think it's the techniques by themselves. Otherwise, Kosin judo would have spread like wildfire. With that being said, there are many elements that go into Brazilian jiu-jitsu, the marketing, the Horian's uh, vision to uh, uh, spread jiu-jitsu in the United States. 
And in fact, just going back to the Gracie issue, if there's anyone I was unfair with in the book, it was Horian Gracie. I have a job here because of him. In fact, every Brazilian teaching jiu-jitsu abroad owes thanks to Horian Gracie because he was the first one to open the doors. So he was very important in marketing jiu-jitsu in the US and he made it something exciting, something that people wanted to be part of. It wasn't just a technique in my opinion. I think that the culture of Brazilian jiu-jitsu has aspects of Brazilian culture that are very endearing to a lot of people. Um, other martial arts, other more strict perhaps. In, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you see a more relaxed manner. You see that surf culture. You see people, if you show up five minutes late, no one's gonna yell at you. You can take your time. You, know, you can chat with your, mat, your, your mates on the, on the mat and like, you know, make a, make a joke. And you can go out, you're acai after training. You're walking around in flip-flops and chilling. That sort of relaxed beach culture is something that Brazil you know, uh, it's, it's an aspect of Brazilian culture. It's very ingrained in Brazilian culture, in fact. And I think that relaxed manner was an important element. It wasn't the only element, but it was an important element in the help of spread of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu around the world. So I don't deny the cultural heritage. I think it is obvious. I just like to give Japan its due credit because at the end of the day, it's their martial art. What is very interesting is the Japanese are not obsessed with calling it Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. They call it Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, no problem, right? But for some reason, you get Americans and Brazilians arguing about who created what, and the people who are best positioned to make a claim for Japanese Jiu-Jitsu are completely silent on this. The question of innovation, he is talking about open canon. She mentions Judo as a closed canon. That's why Jiu-Jitsu is better because it has an open canon, which I make that point in the book. I do believe that an open canon is important. But that being said, I'm not sure that's the case in Judo. I know they have, you know, what Yuki Nakai calls a creative Judo. Some, I've heard some people call it creative Judo, where there's more room for improvement and evolution. Jiu-Jitsu has a wide open canon, which I agree with. I think that's better for the sport that there is an open canon. There are curriculums, there is structure, but the point I was making is that the structure is looser in Jiu-Jitsu than it is in Judo. And I think that's a good thing. So even though it, he, he may perceive, he may think that he's contradicting something I said or he's refuting something in my book. He's actually just agreeing with exactly what I said. In fact, some of the examples he uses are in the book. He believes I'm a little pro-judo and I'm defending, you know, Jigoro Kano's uh, strict uh, way of doing things. I just, it's, the, the, listen to the last point are a little, uh, they correlate a little bit. I'm not sure I think that's fair to say that um, I think that judo is that I'm siding with judo. I never trained judo, by the way. I'm terrible at judo. Like my judo is less than mediocre. I've never had a judo coach. I've never been ranked. But there's some aspects of Japanese culture that I made into judo that I think Brazilian jiu-jitsu would benefit from. In fact, I think there's some aspects of Brazilian culture we would all benefit from as a culture, as a society. I appreciate the hierarchy. I appreciate the respect. I appreciate the humility. I appreciate some of their pragmatism on the mats. I think that's something that we lost too much of and we're losing more and more of it. Like the trash talking we see today, I can't see that in the Olympics. I don't see a judoka doing that. I'm not saying they're angels. I'm not saying everything about Brazilian jiu-jitsu is bad. I love Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I wouldn't want it any other way except for maybe some more respect towards opponents, a little more respect on the mats. I think we would benefit from that. And that's the point that I make in the book. I don't think that I'm not siding with judo. I have no affiliation with judo whatsoever. Point number 10. Um, this is something that seems to upset a lot of people because they have this idea that there was this huge technical revolution in Brazil and the idea that someone from judo was better than someone in jiu-jitsu in Brazil in the 1970s or 80s is absurd to a lot of people. Uh, Fabio doesn't like this point. He mentions it. He thinks it's quite ridiculous, actually. I don't, I mean, perhaps I'm, I could blame for not explaining myself better in the book. Perhaps he could be blamed for not doing a bigger, making a bigger effort to understand what I was saying. But it's important to draw the distinction here between what I call a technical canon and individual performance. For example, if you get a black belt from the 1980s and you had him roll with the Afro, a black belt in jiu-jitsu from the South Zone, let's say someone from Carlson Gracie's school, and you had him roll with the average black belt in judo, chances are Carlson Grace's guy was gonna tap him nine out of 10. Now at the elite level in judo, maybe that would have been different, but we're talking about the average here. It's more than fair to say that in the 1970s and 80s, the average Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt would have been better than the average judo black belt on the ground. I think that's very fair to say. That's not what I meant though. I was talking about the technical canon. So individually, a performance individual can be very high. Uh, even though the jiu-jitsu might be very simple. For example, uh, Roger Grace has a very simple jiu-jitsu, yet it is highly effective. And then you get a guy like, you know, some competitors have very sophisticated bearing bowl or lapel guards, but they may not be good competitors. Maybe they never win. Maybe they don't roll well, but they know a lot. So these are different things. What I insist on is that the technical canon in Japan was far more sophisticated than it was in Brazil in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, up to the early 90s. 
It wasn't until the inception of IBJJF or CBJJ in 1994 that the competition really starts picking up in Brazil. Fabio mentioned that there's evolution the whole time. Yes, but it was very slow. Why was it slow? Very few competitors, very few competitions. If you have very few competitors and very few competitions with very few people in it, well, the result is that evolution does exist, but it's very slow because there's not a lot of selective pressure into the moves. Now, once you start what we would call the Cambrian Revolution, uh, 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 Cambrian Explosion in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is 94, you get an organized, you get more organized tournaments, you get more consistent events, you get a lot more schools with a lot more practitioners. What happens? There's technical innovation. So this technical innovation that people, this boom of technical innovation really starts in 94 and you can see it pick up. And that's when you see Butterfly, Spider Guard, Half Guard, De La Riva, right? But a lot of these moves are already known to the Japanese back in the 1920s and 30s. In fact, if you get a minute, after you watch this video, type in Judo Berimbolo on YouTube and you're gonna see a, a Judo Berimbolo. These guys were doing it way back in the day. In other words, I think that we have to draw the distinction between individual performance, which was certainly very high in the South Zone and on Rio de Janeiro in the 1980s, and the technical canon, which was certainly far more advanced in Japan and Judo than it was in Brazil, up to the time where a competition scene was created that gave, you know, created the platform for Jiu Jitsu to evolve as a martial art into what it is today. Number 11, change of rule set. He suggests that my idea of changing the rule set to penalizing guard pulling is less martial. I don't see how that is. I think that a huge problem with Jiu Jitsu is that we're not good enough at takedowns. Granted, that has changed over the years. We absorbed a lot from wrestling, we absorbed a lot from Judo over the years. But there's a lot of problems, like a lot of our black belts don't know how to take someone down. I'm blamed, I could be blamed for this too. I pull guard my whole life. But I do think it's important that we emphasize stand-up for self-defense purposes, for MMA purposes, that we teach our guys on how to get on top of someone if you really have to. I think that's a huge problem in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and I address it in the book. So my view of penalizing guard pulling is not less martial, it is more martial than guard pulling. I don't see how anyone can you know, think otherwise. Don't take my word for it, watch the UFC. And you're gonna see very clearly that being on top is very dominant. Everyone understands this. So the idea that guard is a more martial art approach to fighting to me is incorrect. I think guard is an extension of fighting on the ground, of course, but you're not supposed to be on bottom, you're supposed to be on top. It is when you fail to be on top that you play guard. Point number 12, Fabio at some point asked rhetorically, who, asked the, who, who built the, the legacy of jiu-jitsu in Brazil? The Gracie family. Right, he answers, which is something I agree with. Like, once again, like I hate this idea that I'm attacking or, uh, 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 or taking credit from anyone. I mentioned Hoist as a hero, Carlson as a hero, uh, the role of George Gracie, which most, like no one in the family did more than me, in fact, to raise his name. So how am I attacking them if I'm trying to bring a name to light? Is it that these people have this quasi-fanatical view interpretation of history, it's dogmatic as it gets, and anyone who deviates from it must be biased, but they're not biased. No, the bias coming from me when I'm presenting all these facts and evidence, right? I think it's a very uh, um, unfair portrayal. I make it very clear that their role is central. I'm not taking credit away from anyone. Yes, the legacy uh, um, of Jiu Jitsu in Brazil is largely thanks to Carlos and Helio, but not only Carlos and Helio. It is important to remember people like Holes Gracie, Carlos and Gracie, Osvaldo Fada, Gio Mori, Takeo Yano, I can keep going, it's quite a large list, but those are some of the most important names. So they didn't do it alone, but yes, they are central. No one's attacking anyone. I think that the people who are biased are the people who are upset at any deviation at the official narrative. 13, at some point he questions me accusing the family of elitism because they only taught the wealthy people in Rio de Janeiro. Once again, his criticism is responded to in the book. If I'm blaming them, I'm also blaming myself because I made the, I did the same thing. I didn't go to Sub-Saharan Africa to teach Jiu-Jitsu. I didn't go to Central America in some poor village in Central America. I came to Las Vegas to teach Jiu-Jitsu because I wanted to make money. So if I'm accusing the Gracie family of focusing on making money, I'm only extending the accusation to myself and I write that in the book. Fabio chooses to omit that, acting like if I'm accusing them of trying to make money from Jiu-Jitsu as if I were a hypocrite. Well, I'm not a hypocrite, I admit to it, right? So I don't think that's an important question. I think that most people will prefer to make money from jiu-jitsu when they can. What I was doing, in fact, in that chapter was giving credit to Osvaldo Fada because he opened jiu-jitsu, uh, the doors to jiu-jitsu to a lot of people who had no opportunity to train. And if because of him, we have these projetos in Brazil, all these projects of all these kids training for free. And that's something that he started, which is quite remarkable. So I think he plays a very important role in the history of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I wasn't trying to take credit or attack the Gracie family. 
I was just saying, look how admirable it is that Osvaldo Fada was given his time and energy for free to all these children in Brazil, and he did it for decades. I think that is remarkable. I think it ought to be remembered. I was not trying to attack the Gracie family. Point 14. He uh, believes I was, uh, the word he uses is mal educado, which is like unpolite, right, or rude to Hela Grace's biography of her father. I disagree. In fact, I call her an intelligent woman in the book. I give her compliments. There are problems with her biography because they, it consists exclusively of testimonies of friends and family friends. Now, if I would write my own biography and, you, you know, whoever was writing that, uh, or if someone were to write my biography and they only interviewed my friends and family, that would be a bad biography because it's a very biased portrayal. For example, there's an interview in the book uh, with Armando Reedit and Hela Gracie went to interview him and he said some things about Carlos Gracie to her that she didn't like. She didn't put it in the book. Well, I know it's his daughter. I don't expect her to write a book that's going to attack her father. I get it. But from a historical perspective, the book has been impoverished because you only get one side. You don't get a more complete account. He thinks I'm being rude to her. That is not, a, that's not an ad hominem attack. This is not me attacking her as a person. I was very polite to her on the phone. She was very polite to me and no issues with her whatsoever. But her biography does have problems because it is one-sided. It is only, it consists exclusively of, you know, testimony of family, friends, and family members. And, you know, for the, the period of history that I'm most interested in, it is entirely based on Carlos Gracie's testimony. And that is problematic. You can't have history written on, based off the testimony of one person. You would need a body of knowledge. You need historiography. You need many sources. If you're curious about this, open any good history book and go into bibliography and see how many sources you're going to see. Thousands of sources. And that's how you build a, a case in history. You build off of thousands of sources. You don't go off the testimony of one person, say it's gospel truth, and then when someone challenges that, you call that person biased. That's quite absurd. Conclusion. Fabio claims that I failed at my mission, uh, I claim that the Gracies are central to this, and that my mission of being impartial, and my mission to prove that Carlos did not train under Maeda. I tackled all these points earlier. That was none of my intention. I love jiu-jitsu, I love history. If I have any bias in all of this, I am unaware of it. I do have a, a bias I am aware of. I love jiu-jitsu, I just want it to be better. And I think that history has to do with identity. And I think for you to know yourself, you have to know the good and the bad, right? We have to be realistic about what this martial art is and where it came from, comes from. And I enjoyed writing the book, I enjoyed producing the documentary, and I enjoyed talking about this. But there was never any intention to attack anyone or take credit from anyone. Um, this is just, I, I enjoy history. That's what it comes down to, okay? But I think some people that are forming opinions without reading the book are be very unfair. You should never have an opinion on a book that you've never read. In fact, you should read it with an open mind and open heart, and that's good reading. You read it with willing to change your mind. We don't come into the, you know, any, 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 don't come start reading any book and have your mind made up about what the book is about. Give it, some, give it a chance. Give it a chance to change your mind. If you don't do that, if you don't read the book, you're not willing to change your mind, then just be quiet and don't have an opinion. It's fine not to know, but it is ridiculous to have an opinion on a book that you've never read, okay? And to finalize, just to end this, uh, this, uh, this talk, if Fabio still has issues with my book, I'm happy to have a debate with him. He can choose the format, he can choose the location, the channel, the time, I'm happy to discuss jiu-jitsu history with him. He can pick any of these topics or all of them. I'm happy to have a discussion with him anytime he wants. And if he chooses not to, that's fine. I still respect him a lot as a team leader, as a professor, as one of the co-founders of Alliance. He's done a phenomenal job in jiu-jitsu. And I admire him in a lot of ways, but in terms of jiu-jitsu history, he's simply wrong. And uh, there's just no way around that. But if you would like to discuss it with me, the invitation is there. I'm happy to reach out to him anytime he wants to. He can reach out to me and we can set up a debate, okay? Thank you everyone for listening. I hope to see you guys again next time.